Hi, and welcome to this 16th little quickie. And I've been getting a lot of questions about these guys, tapers. So that's what this little quickie is going to be all about. Now we have tapers on the end of collets that are used to hold parts. And tapers on the end of collets that are used to hold tools. We have the tapers on accessories that are used to hold accessories. MT3 to J33. And this is for mounting a drill chuck onto a taper. We have tapers that are used to make big tapers smaller and others that make small tapers bigger. And we even have tapers that are used for measuring tapers. But before we get into what tapers are used for and how to calculate and whatnot, well we should get a good idea of what tapers are. And a taper is a geometric shape really. It's based on a cone. Now, a taper is a cylindrical shape, but it doesn't have a constant diameter. The cross-section of a taper is round or circular. That's why we say it's cylindrical. But it goes from large to small, or from small to large, in a constant and progressive way. So, these are linear shapes in that they are not curved. The sides of the cone are flat and straight, or not flat, they're curved but straight. And if I go from one side to the other, well, I'm describing two sides that are at angles one to the other. So we have a fair idea of what tapers are, but what are they used for? Well, we can have taper pins, and those tapered pins are used to align machine parts one to the other. We can have tapered collets, as we've already mentioned, and they're used to clamp down on parts uh, forcibly. And we have tapers that fix and position tools. And if we think of uh, tapered shank drills, well, we realize that those tapers fix the tool into the spindle as well as center it and position it. So, tapers can be used for many, many things. Uh, but why? I mean, what makes tapers that important? I mean, they're not easy to produce, at least they don't seem to be. And why not use parallel shafted tools and tooling? Well, we do. So, to see the difference and to understand why we use the tapers, well, we'd best start by looking at parallel shafted tools. And for that, we're going to be looking at this well-done type shank uh, end mill, and we'll put it here. And, oddly enough, this ventilated uh, dowel pin. It's a quarter-inch dowel pin that's ventilated. Uh, and not many people have ever seen these because it's not something that's used that often in home shops. So we'll put both those tools up front here so we can zoom in on them and take a look at them. And then we can come back to what really matters, me. So here we have our parallel shaft end mill and our dowel pin that's a ventilated dowel pin. So we can see here that the shaft of this end mill is parallel and that we have a flat. It's a well done type shank. And we have a flat for a set screw. A quite normal setup for a tool that inserts into a solid a tool holder, okay? Now, uh, that means that this shank has to be quite parallel and quite precise in diameter and that the hole that it fits into has to be quite parallel and quite accurate and precise in diameter as well. Now, this relieved dowel pin right here, we see incorporates a groove on the outside. It's not a thread, it's actually a groove and it has a threaded hole on the end. And let's talk about why that's made that way. So let's start by looking at this well-known shank tool or end mill. Now this parallel shank is made to be inserted into a hole, a parallel hole, on a milling machine tool holder. And, and that's normal, it's parallel. And that implies that this shaft, this tenon on the tool here, the shank,
has to be smaller than the hole it's being inserted into. And, and, and that's obvious. And seen as it's fixed in that hole using a set screw that pushes laterally on the shaft, well, that creates a big problem. This tool is always going to be off-center. So we say, okay, well, let's make it so accurate that there is no play. Well, that's impossible. A zero clearance is a press fit, and this needs clearance. So let's say we have something like a thousandth of an inch difference, which really isn't very much. Well, that lateral thrust will make it so that we have half a thou off-center. And that is a problem now. It's not a huge problem, but it is a problem with uh, accurate tooling. And that problem can be resolved with tapers, because if we use an R8 tapered holder, well, the taper here fixes very positively the part, and it also centers it automatically into uh, the uh, spindle. So, so that is one of the main advantages of tapers. Tapers, as far as tooling, rotary tooling goes, well, tapers center things on the axis of rotation automatically. For our second reason to justify the use of tapers, well, let's take a closer look at our ventilated dowel pin. Now, this is a regular dowel pin, but it has a ventilated helical groove on it that permits air to get to its end. And it has a tapped hole to screw into a puller to retract it. Now, why is that? Well, a regular dowel pin, the ones we're used to seeing, are, are full. There, there's no groove and there's no tapped hole. They're just a regular dowel pin. And these regular dowel pins require drift holes. If you're designing a part and you have a dowel in that part, there needs to be a drift hole. And that means that where the pin is inserted in the opposite direction, there is a hole that could be smaller than the hole that the pin is in that can be used to insert a drift punch to remove that pin. If it is a blind dowel hole, well, you need these ventilated ones because when they're pressed into the hole, the air often will be forced out. And if there's no way to get air back into the end of that hole, well, they're very difficult to remove because obviously it's a lot easier to push very hard on the dowel pin than it is to try and fish it out. Now, that's what the groove is for, just to let air to get to the bottom of a hole that a dowel is in that doesn't have a drift hole in it. And obviously, well, the tapped hole at the end here is for a puller so that you can pull this dowel out of its hole because there's no hole for a drift punch. Well, that's all fine and dandy. But it does illustrate a problem. This dowel pin is for aligning components. And it has to be inserted into a hole that's, yes, as we've said before, smaller than its dowel if I want to be able to assemble and disassemble regularly. Now, it could be press fit, and that's a whole other can of beans. But for regularly disassembled parts, this cannot be a press fit. Dowel pins won't do that. And it has the same problems as my well-done shanked tool had. And that is that if I'm using it for alignment or positioning, well, there's going to have to be some play. And dowel uh, pins that are tapered or tapered pins don't have that problem. There's another problem with a dowel pin. And that is that when it is tight in a hole, any damage or dirt or problem means that when I'm retracting it, I have to pull it out over its whole length. And cold welding a, a, a dowel pin into a hole is a real problem. And taper pins, well, don't have that problem either. So taper pins align with zero play because they are tapered the same way that the tapered shank would align the tool. And they go from zero play, zero clearance, to very loose all in one foul swoop because as soon as they're loose, they're free to come out of the hole. Whereas this dowel always has some play on it. It never positions zero 
play. And when retracted, it does have to slide out progressively of a hole, and that can eventually create a problem. So, more advantages for tapers. Just a quick mention here. Our three-jaw chucks, the ones that we use on drill presses, well, they also use this same property of tapers because the three jaws move simultaneously because they're moving along a tapered edge. So it's a little more complex than a regular taper, but it's still using that same centering uh, principle. It's safe to say that all tapers position things in a concentric fashion or line things up if you prefer. And, and that's true for all tapers. But uh, there are two families of tapers, well actually three families of tapers. The third being aesthetic. And, and as an example of that, well let's look at the taper on our hammer handle project. It's there to make the handle look good, to balance things out, to remove excess material, yes. But it's not a standard machine taper. It's a freehand, not freehand, but it's a created taper, okay, made up taper. But as far as machine tapers go, there's two large families. There's positioning tapers, which all tapers do, but there's one that does just that. And there's uh, fixing tapers, tapers that fix parts into machines. So the parts that are fixed into the machine are aligned as well. So both line up but one only lines up, whereas the other lines up and fixes the tool or the part in the machine. So we have two families of mechanical tapers. One that fixes the part in position and positions it, and one that just positions it. And what's the difference? Well, it's the angle that changes. If I have a very uh, progressive taper, something that is quite acute, okay, in angle, well, I will have a taper that will wedge itself into its uh, mating hole and those are fixing tapers okay they position and hold the tool in and as an example of that because there's many many different standards but as an example in north america the most popular are the morse tapers mts mt1 mt2 mt3 mt0 uh, MT tapers, Morse taper, number such and such. And the bigger the number, the bigger the taper. And not the angle, just the diameter. Morse tapers are somewhere around three degrees. They're, they're never the same angle from one number of Morse to the next, but they're around three degrees. And that is a total included angle. So we can see that it's quite acute, a very, very progressive and slow taper. And our Positioning tapers, well, they are much more obtuse, okay? They are much wider angled. And we'll see those on a lot of our milling machine tapers because we want them to position, but we don't want them to fix the part. When I relieve the pressure on the drawbar of a milling machine, I want my tool to be easy to retract. I don't want it wedged into the spindle. And for that positioning taper, we're going to look at one again in North America that's quite popular, and that is the MMT tapers, milling machine tapers, MMT-30s, MMT-40s, MMT-50s, and whatnot. So we can see that there are major advantages to using uh, tapers comparatively to parallel tooling. But what about cost? Well, surprisingly, in a production situation, producing tapers can be quite economical. Now, you're going to say, well, it's very complex. There's angles to respect and all. Tapers, what really matters is the angle. The geometric tolerance is important. The dimension, as far as dimensional tolerance goes, well, is secondary. And what do I mean by that? Here we have an MT3 taper that's made to be inserted into an MT3 taper. Now, it has an angle to respect. If I were to produce this MT3 taper a couple of thousandths of an inch smaller than what it is, it would still work just as well. Now, obviously, there's a limit to how small it can be, 
but the diameter isn't all that crucial. Whereas with a parallel shaft, its geometry is important. It has to be really parallel. But its dimension is also very important. So I end up paying through the nose to get geometry and very, very accurate dimension. Whereas with tapers, the geometry is crucial and the dimension is secondary. So it actually isn't that expensive to produce. Now we're not going to get away with it. We're going to have to do some calculations. And there are plenty of formulas for different types of standard tapers and all this. And it's quite complex. And big D minus little d over L plus this plus the angle of attack of the sun if you were so many thousand kilometers from the equator and so on and so forth. No, we're going to simplify things. The most complex part about tapers are finding, is finding the, the info. And for that we're going to have to look into our machinery's handbook. But once that is found, we're going to have to use some trig, or probably going to have to use some trig, to figure out our basic angle. And once we have that, well, we can go to our machines and produce our, our tapers. But, but what's important to note here is that you're not going to get away with it. You have to use the trig. So you have to knuckle down and learn it. And remember, we have a video for that, our introduction to trigs and triangles. I mentioned it in, I think, our last lesson, uh, lesson five of the benchwork uh, techniques. Uh, trigs and triangles, here's a link to that video for refresher, a little refresher on trigonometry. And for us, well, let's head over to our whiteboard and figure out our basic angles for our MT, we'll say an MT3 taper and an MMT40 taper. So, here we are. We're going to do an example for an MT3 taper, a male taper, uh, and that's a Morse taper number three. And if we look in our handbook, well, we'll find on the chart or in the chart for Morse tapers that my TPI, not threads per inch in this case, but my taper per inch for an MT3 taper is 0.0519. Now, what does that mean? That means that the taper progressively gets larger at a rate of 0.0519, that we'll call 52,000, just for simplicity here, 52 thousandths of an inch for every inch in length. So if we look at this, we can see that a taper is a cone that has its end cut off. Okay, so that we see the cone here, and here is would be what we would call normally a taper. Now, if I look at that, I can see that I start on a one inch, taper per inch, one inch length, I start from nothing, and it progressively gets larger. And this little green line here indicates by how much it's grown. But the TPI is overall growth, and that means that it's this side plus this side. These two segments is how much this taper has grown in one inch. And that's why we're going to have to cut it in two to do our calculations, because I really only want one side of that uh, overall angle. I can see here that I've already figured it out. The angle that I'm looking for, or the angle of one side of my MT3 cone, is going to be 1.489 degrees. 1.489 degrees. That's close to 1.5 degrees, and that makes sense because I know that my uh, self-holding uh, tapers, fixing tapers as I tend to call them, well, should be somewhere around 3 degrees total angle. So half of my total would be somewhere around 1.5 degrees. So that's, that tells me that I'm probably right here. But how did I get that? Well, here, 1, 2, and 3. Three steps for my calculation. And again, if trig gives you a hard time, here's the link to my trigs and triangle uh, little quickie video. It's important to, to get into trig, at least the basic trigonometry. But here, what I'm looking for 
is this angle here that is half the total angle. And for that, I'm going to be using tan. So tan of the unknown angle here. Why tan? Well, because I know the opposite side and I know the adjacent side. The opposite is half of my TPI. And my adjacent is one inch because it's tapered per inch. So that much growth in this distance of one inch. So I know those two variables. So I'm going to use tan of the unknown angle equals one half TPI over one. Why one half? As I mentioned, only half of the total angle is what I'm looking for here. So one half TPI over one. Uh, this gives me a, a square triangle. So I can do tan here. So in the second part, I divide both sides by tan and I multiply both sides by one. Okay, I manipulate my formula and I end up here with uh, unknown angle equals 0 0.026, half of my TPI divided by tan. Now, you can divide by tan on your calculator or, or on most calculators. What you have to do is multiply by tan exponent 1 or minus 1. If you bring tan up here and it's you're allowed to do so in algebra, well you have to change its exponent from a positive 1 to a minus 1. So that's what I've done in the third part here. My unknown angle equals 0 0.026 times tan exponent minus 1. On your calculator, that could appear as an inverse or second function also. So second function tan or inverse tan equals tan exponent minus 1. And if you do that, well, you'll end up with your unknown angle of 1.489. So it's not an unknown angle anymore. And that tells me that if I set up for cutting this cone or this taper, well, I'm going to be wanting to set up my angle at... 1.489 degrees because on the lathe when you cut one side of a part you're cutting the other side at the same time so if I cut half of my overall angle I end up with my complete amplitude and my TPI of 0 0.0519 for a taper knowing the angle is only half the battle because a taper isn't an angle it's an angle with a diameter, with a length, and it all has to mesh together. So for my MT3 external, I'm specifying here because the variables change. Now obviously your taper angle, the angle of your taper doesn't change. Internal or external, MT3, it's all the same angle. But lengths and diameters, well, they, they change. So my MT3 external, I have a TPI of 0 0.0519 or 52 thousandths of an inch as we saw a few minutes ago. And I've already calculated my half angle at 1.489 degrees. Great. What's its diameter? Well, a taper doesn't have a diameter. It has a multitude of diameters. So it has a di diameter, but where? Well, we want to know its diameter at its start or at its end. For an MT3 external, the diameter that's given to us, well, is the small end of the taper. And the small end of an MT3 taper should measure 0.778 uh, thousandths of an inch. So 778 thousandths of an inch. That's what its small end should, taper, should measure, should taper. But they don't give us the large end. We'll see. And we need a length, because if we have an angle, we have a starting diameter, and we have a length, well, we can figure out the large diameter, and we can start figuring out things to measure. So, for the length, L here, in the handbook, they give us our variables B and T. B being the overall length of the taper, including the tang for our male taper, and T being the length of the tang. Okay, so I have to subtract that length. So B minus T, 3.875 minus 0.5625, gives us 
a length of taper for an MT3 at 3.3125 inches. Well, that's great. I have what I need to produce my taper, my MT3 external taper. But I might want to know its major diameter, just because sometimes that's an easier diameter to measure. So, if I know what the small one is, how can I find the big one? Well, I have pretty well everything that I need here. I have my starting diameter, I have the length of the taper, and I have the taper per inch. So, if I go my starting diameter plus 3.3125 times the uh, taper per inch, well, I should have my large diameter. And it should be somewhere around just a little bit under one inch for an MT3. So let's take a look at that. Point 0.778 plus open bracket 3.3125 times my taper per inch 0 0.0 Five four nine close brackets equals 0.9499. We'll call that 0 0.950. 0 0.950 inches. Here, I forgot that. 950 uh, inches. Uh, 950 thousandths of an inch. And that's my major diameter. Well, all this is great, but there is a problem. And that is that producing a taper is one thing. Measuring it is a whole other can of beans. Now, why would I say that measuring tapers is a problem? Well, because it is. Now, measuring a male taper is hazardous and measuring a female one well it's almost impossible so let's take a look at how to measure the male one we have a part that is not parallel so let's say that we wanted to measure the diameter because for a taper to be good we need form uh, we need angle and we need dimension and we have to get all three bang on if things are going to work out so, let's look at dimension and say, I want to measure the diameter. Well, as we've mentioned already, at the start or at the end, let's say we want to measure the small end. Well, that's very difficult to measure because we have to get our micrometer to sit at the very lip of the part and just sort of hook onto it and gauge if we're holding it properly. And it's really not a very good situation. Quite difficult to do. If, however, I want to do the larger diameter, well, that one's a little easier to measure. I can use my micrometer and I can come down, but I have to purposely hold myself perpendicular to the part. Okay, and because there's no parallel surface on this, this is not a pin, it's a taper, so my micrometer will not sit naturally perpendicular like it is when, well, like it does when I'm measuring a parallel uh, cylindrical shape. So that's a problem, and I have to play with it. I have to move around and measure in several different places around that edge and average out. And I see here that I'm about 950 thou and about a half a thou over. So five ten thousandths over after. Six measurements here would seem to be about at what I'm at. So about a half thou over what we saw a few moments ago for my large diameter. But you have to remember, you really have to measure several times in several places because you're, you're, you're measuring an edge here. And this edge, unlike a parallel pin, well, it's either bird or rounded out. So, so there's no such thing as a perfect edge. And, and that can cause some little problems with our measuring. But you can get away with measuring the large diameter if you're very careful about it. As far as form is concerned, well, we'd have to determine if this surface is straight. And we'll also have to determine the angle. 
So form and angle are quite a problem, but they can be measured, and we'll look at this a little later, using a sign bar, a V-block, a good calculator, and a little patience. The internal MT3 taper, and I have one here, well, is very difficult to measure because the diameter that we have access to is the largest diameter and, and it's difficult to measure for the same reason that the small diameter on the external taper was difficult to measure. And my small diameter on the internal one, the one that should be a little easier to measure, well, I don't have access to it. It's at the bottom of a hole in general and I can't measure it easily. Plus, the form, the shape and the angle are all internal and that creates a lot of problems. Really, the best way to measure an internal taper is to use a gauge, a plug gauge. In this case, a male taper that I can insert into the internal taper to verify the fit. Now, I can insert the taper into the taper to verify the fit and see but it would be better to wipe the two together to be able to determine if I have good geometry and good form. Okay, and for that it's quite simple. We use, I use these Expo uh, pens that are for whiteboards. And you put a small amount on one edge and then once it's dry We'll assemble it lightly, turn it a half turn, retract the male taper, and observe the type of wipe that I have. If this very, very thin thickness of ink wipes off the part completely, or almost completely, well, I'll know that I have a good contact, and that means that I have good geometry and a good angle. So, here I have my male taper with my light uh, erasable ink on it. Here I have my gauge or my female taper. I'm going to assemble them lightly and twist them together just to make sure that I'm wiping completely. I can disassemble and take a look at the result. I can see that I have quite a good wipe almost right up to the top here. So actually this is not a bad assembly. Uh, we have a fair good, fairly good contact here. A bit of marking at the center and that can be due to some scratches on the male taper here. Well measuring a male taper with traditional measuring tools is a bit of a hassle. And we now know that measuring a female taper with traditional tools is almost impossible. You can use uh, gauge balls, uh, very, very accurate steel balls inserted into the female taper to uh, measure depth of insur insertion. Please don't start getting excited with the words I'm using here. But that is complex and requires some serious math skills. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Really, gauging is the way to go and that means that if you have to produce a female taper, well, you should produce a male taper first. Because we can measure very accurately the male taper. Now, once you have that accurate male taper, you can use it as a gauge to produce your female taper. Now, that's a lot of work. But you don't discard your gauge once you've used it. You keep it and you store it carefully because the same tapers tend to come back as far as jobs go. MT2s, MT3s and MT4s you'll be seeing on a regular basis and once you have your gauges for those well you keep them and you don't have to start over that part of the job every time. And to produce a male taper accurately well we have to be able to measure it and we can do that with a sign bar and a v-block. So let's take a look at that. So here we have a sign bar and this sign bar should permit us to measure the angle on our 
a taper, but there's a few problems here. Now, if I put this taper on the sign bar and lift the sign bar to half the angle of the taper, it's going to be difficult to come up to it with a dial indicator and verify that I'm parallel to my surface once I'm at the proper angle. Because the angle that the cone depicts on the sign bar is going to change its angle uh, that it's going to be checking here. I have to have this uh, angular cone parallel, perfectly in line with the sign bar. So that would mean, why don't I put a V-block on it? Now the logic here is that if I put a bar, and this is a parallel bar in the V-block, and I come over it with my dial indicator, I'll see that it is parallel to the base and all is well. So that if I put my taper in there, okay, and bring it up to half the angle of the taper, I should be able to do the same thing. But that won't work because of a problem. This taper sits deeper in the V at its small end than at the big end, whereas the parallel bar sat evenly in the V. And I have to compensate for this difference. And that is the angle C, the angle that the uh, axis of this uh, cone uh, has in relationship to the V-block. So let's take a look at how to calculate that. Here's the basic setup. And there are four angles that are required here, or that need to be known. Angle A is the angle overall of my taper. Angle C is the angle between the sign bar and the center axis of my tapered part. Angle B is the angle between the top of the surface plate and the top of my sign bar. And finally, angle D is the angle of the V-block. Now, D really isn't that important. We need it for our calculations. But D, in reality, is always 45 degrees because V-blocks are almost invariably 90 degrees. So D over 2 is an angle that we need for our calculations, and it'll be 45. We'll see that in a few minutes. And this means here that what I want is to find angle B so I can figure out the Joe blocks I need to set myself at the proper angle. And to find B, I have to know C and A. Now, A I already know because I figured out my half angle before and it's really the half angle that I want because to find B, I have to add C to half of the tapered angle. Uh, so C plus the second half of the angle on the, the taper is going to be equal to B. So let's head over to the whiteboard and take a look at that calculation. So what I want to find is the angle between the surface plate and the top of the sign bar so that I can get my Joe block set up and set myself up to the proper angle. And that was described in the handbook as being angle B. And that's the calculation that I have here. B equals C plus A over 2. Now A over 2 is my half angle, angle of this, the, the taper itself divided by 2. And I've already figured out my half angle to be 1.489 degrees. So this A over 2, I've already figured it out. But the C, I don't have. C is the angle between the top of the sign bar and the center axis of the taper that I'm checking. I don't know what that angle is, but we have a formula for that, and it's right here. Sine C equals sine of 1.489. That is my half angle of my taper uh, here, okay? Uh, and it's divided by the half sine of the half angle of the V block that I'm using. And the V-block that I'm using, as most V-blocks, is 90 degrees, so it's sine of 45. If I calculate this, it ends up to being sine C equals 0 0.0367. 0 0.0367 is sine C, so if I divide both sides by sine, I end up with C equals 2.106 degrees.
That is the angle between the top of the sign bar and the center of the taper that I'm trying to verify that's sitting in the V-block. Okay, so that's what I needed to be able to figure out my B, which is the angle that I want for the sign bar, and that from there I can figure out my drill blocks that I need. So B equals C plus A over 2. A over 2 is my half angle, so B equals 2.106, I just figured out, plus 1.489 degrees. B equals 3.595 degrees. And that means that if I set my sign bar at 3.595 degrees and that I install my taper in a V-block and that I run over the taper with my, uh, uh, the, the, my dial indicator, sorry about that, well, I'm going to end up with, and that, I sh sh that it shows that there is zero movement, that everything is parallel to the surface plate. Well, that indicates to me that my angle is bang on. So there we go. With those calculations, well, we can really set our sign bar up to measure very accurately the angle of a taper. But it also gives us something more. That way of comparatively measuring the angle of the taper also tells us if the form is correct. Is that surface really straight? And it also must be combined with a measurement for the major diameter of that male taper that we're making. One thing that I forgot to mention when we were talking about gauges is that the gauge gives you an indication of the angle and the form. But it can also, and it is made to give you an indication of diameter, so the gauge really gives you everything. And to know if we have the proper diameter from a gauge, in this case the female gauge, well we'll measure from the end of our male taper to the top of the taper on the female gauge, and that dimension will indicate to us if the diameter on the male taper is correct. Well, I hope that answers some questions on tapers because I've been getting a lot of questions. Now, to see how tapers are cut, well, we have two ways of cutting tapers that are generally acceptable ways in the shop other than numerical control, which obviously is the more modern way, but the old school way, well, would probably be with a taper attachment. And we have a video showing that. It's the part three of the hammer handle project. And here's a link to that video. Now, if you're cutting shorter, uh, more pronounced tapers, well, often we'll be using the uh, compound rest offset method. I'll start that over, the compound rest offset method. And for that, well, we also have a video, and here's a taper on the hammer head project, and here's a link to that video. Now, there's also the tailstock offset method, but it's not a method that I generally recommend uh, because it is very finicky, and it's a little hard on the machine. So, really, something that I would tend to want to avoid. So, that's our little quickie must be close to 40 minutes. A little quickie on tapers. Uh, I hope it was of help. Uh, until we meet again, we'll have fun. More importantly, be safe and happy machining.